Good evening, family, and welcome to Straight Talk No Chaser with Dr. JJG. Thank you, each and every one of you, for joining in with us on tonight. We have an extremely, extremely special episode with us on tonight uh, as we are in the midst of this global pandemic known as COVID-19 coronavirus. We are going to be speaking with some of the DMV's health care heroes on tonight. Some ladies that are on the front lines doing the work in healthcare, but doing the work in healthcare in the midst of COVID-19. And so we are excited about them being with us on tonight and them just taking the time out of their schedules to share in with us during what has been an extremely busy, tiring, and stressful season for them. We want to lift up on tonight, especially two of our panelists that were unable to be with us, uh, one of which, Samantha Carroll, who is on the front lines as a COVID-19 screener. Uh, an extended day, as I'm sure you can imagine, in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of what's going on. And so uh, we send our, our positive vibes and strength to Samantha on tonight as, as she begins to close out her work day. And then we also want to send our our thoughts and our prayers uh, to our other panelist, Jamel Butler, on this evening who couldn't be with us. She and her family are in the midst of dealing with a COVID-19 loss in their family. And so, Jamel, know that you are in our thoughts and prayers on tonight and that we wish you well in the days ahead. Mm -hmm. Be encouraged. We will get through this together. We are excited about our other panelists that are joining us on this evening. I'm going to introduce them to you at this time. I want to take this opportunity to welcome with us on this evening Venus Escambisi Walker. Ms. Escambisi Walker is a registered radiology technologist, mammography program coordinator. That is a mouthful. Amen. And she'll share with us a little bit more about all that entails shortly. She served in the hospital industry as a hospital worker for over 36 years, 36 years of dedicated service. Uh, she also happens to be an independent owner of a health and wellness business since 2006. Won't you help me welcome on tonight, Mrs. Venus Escambisi Walker. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest joining us on this evening is Ms. Chastity Johnson. Ms. Johnson has worked in the healthcare administration in a Washington, D.C. metropolitan region for over 20 years. She's a board certified fellow with the American College of Healthcare Executives and a certified patient experience professional. She currently oversees patient experience in a local healthcare setting and served as a patient advocate for many years. Won't you help me welcome on tonight, Ms. Chastity Johnson. Thank you, welcome, so glad to be here. Want to welcome as a panelist on this evening, Ms. Lachey Williams. Ms. Williams is a board certified registered nurse uh, who has two years of experience on a surgical unit specializing in women's services. She also floats as a nurse on the mother baby section of the maternity ward. Mm -hmm. Help me welcome on tonight, Ms. Lachey Williams. Thanks for having me. <laughs> also want to welcome on tonight, Dr. Damali M. Wilson. Dr. Wilson is a PhD prepared social scientist and a certified pediatric nurse practitioner. She has over 10 years of research and clinical experience centered on child, adolescent, and family health development and well-being. Dr. Wilson holds a Bachelor's of Science from Hampton University, a Master's of Science in Nursing from the University of Pennsylvania, and a PhD from John Hopkins University. Won't you help me welcome on tonight Dr. Damali Wilson. Wow. <laughs> so we are excited uh, about uh, the just the wealth of information and knowledge uh, that you ladies bring to the table on this evening, but also uh, your firsthand um, experience. And so we're going to jump right into it. Uh, COVID-19 uh, coronavirus caught the entire world by surprise. I'm sure we can all agree to that with how fast that it swooped in, began to infect uh, people, began to claim lives and shutting down any place where the spread uh, could be massive and essentially upending life for all of us 
as we know it. And so I guess the first question I, that I would ask each of you, um, being healthcare workers, healthcare professionals, uh, do you feel as though uh, the medical community at large was prepared uh, to handle the emergence of this global pandemic? Uh, whoever would like to take it first, go ahead. I can start. <laughs> I do not think that it was, it. I think that we weren't ready. Um, I just, I am on the surgical unit, so it hit me in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't able, I lost a lot of work and a lot of my colleagues lost work um, from OR nurses to pre-op nurses, PACU nurses. A lot of us were furloughed and didn't have anything to do in the hospital, didn't know what to do with us. That's one aspect of how they didn't even know how to handle it. They kind of started feeding us different places or telling us like, we can't offer you a full-time position right. and just kind of making up positions for us. Mm -hmm. And I just also talked to my other friends and we all had different protocols and nothing was ever the same from hospital to hospital. So I just felt like we weren't prepared we're prepared for small crisis, but like not something this big. Wow. I would agree with her. I think it's, it's new. And so I think hospitals did the very best and are still doing the very best. But I think there have been lessons that we've had to learn along the way simply because we have not experienced this before. So I would say no, not prepared, but I would say yes. Most organizations did everything they could and are still doing all that they can to turn the corner and to, to be as prepared as possible in terms of stockpiling supplies, but I, I would say it's a combination of no, and then yes, as quickly as, as we could get together. I completely agree with Chastity um, and Lachey, in particular the piece about the, the challenges with the preparedness are largely because in healthcare, um, an evidence base is largely how we like to practice. And with something new, we're, the evidence is developing as the disease is evolving. Mm -hmm. um, so from that standpoint, a lot of people that are very scientific, very protocol-based, very evidence-based, where none of that exists, we are really figuring it out on the fly. And so we absolutely were not <laughs> prepared um, for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I work um, in women's health also. So um, typically I work with a lot of biopsy patients and surgical patients. And like you said, it changed the hospital flow. So for the last nine weeks, I've been working in the emergency room, like four to five days a week. Mm -hmm. um, thank goodness I was able to transition because I'd worked there so many, you know, for many years, but it did change the flow. Um, they were rerouting people to different areas to try and, you know, take care of the onslaught of patients. But one thing I can say is because we are in a hospital situation, we learn to adapt. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we learn to do what we have to do to help the patient. It isn't always convenient. Um, protocols and sometimes are, are, are created as we're going along and the protocols are changing constantly. Mm -hmm. So that makes it really um, stressful for a lot of people because they had to learn how to do new things, um, learn how to change the rules mm -hmm. um, to adapt because this, this virus, there is no, this is one thing I've learned. In a pandemic, there is no emergency, okay? So um, a lot of times people that were scheduled for surgeries, their surgeries were canceled, okay? Right. Um, or postponed until now, okay? Mm -hmm. Now people are starting to get their surgeries. Um, women, people that were diagnosed with different cancers at different times, you know, depending on the stages, they couldn't necessarily get this treatment so they would get ex expeditiously, normally. It changed the game. And we're still learning, we're still adapting. Right. Like you know, the panelists are saying, we are learning as we're going along. But so we you, are doing it. We're getting it done. That's what I was going to say. So you, so a skill that you definitely have to have as a healthcare worker is flexibility. You have to be willing uh, to go with the flow, knowing that your willingness to go with the flow impacts the entire operation. And at and it, the moment's notice when there are lives at stake, you have to be willing to step up and perhaps move to a different area, move to a different operation, knowing mm -hmm. that your participation in that could be the difference with life and death for somebody. That's right. And, wow. and yours too. Yours too. Because wow. we had to learn. We really had to change the way that we did things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So, 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 so speaking of that, the learning piece, you know, what, what do you think that has been learned? I know you all are at, at different facilities and, and in different mm -hmm. realms of, of healthcare. What do you think ha has been uh, the biggest 
piece, um, in your opinion, that has been learned to help prepare us uh, for the future with respect to whatever may come down the pike, you know, in the next few months or whatever may come down the pike, you know, in another two or three years from now with respect to things that evolve or pop up out of nowhere as this disease appears to have done? Well, I, you know, and for us and for the public, I think not having enough PPE, having a personal protection okay. equipment mm -hmm. was the thing that really stressed us the most in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, education, because some people, there are still people out there that don't believe that people were dying. You know, that someone might come into the emergency room, you know, short of breath, and then all of a sudden, the next time you turn around, you're looking at them and they're on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that did happen, you know, and it, it's not happening as, as, as often as it did then, but, you know, it kind of, we learned as things were going along. So having that PPE and teaching people that, you know, uh, proper sanitation, having that social distancing, mm -hmm. you know, wearing a mask is important even though it's inconvenient, but for all of us, you know, you know, there every day, I still have to take the point where I have to go into a room where I have to put on two masks, an N95 and a, and a regular surgical mask. Right. And I, my hair has been tied down for nine weeks because I want to cover my hair. Mm -hmm. And then I, I put a, a surgical cap on top of that. I put a plastic gown on. I've got two pairs of gloves, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I've got a visor, right? And uh, that's inconvenient, but it's necessary. So we have to teach people to do what's necessary to protect them, and most importantly, to protect other people, you know. That, that's important. And, and, and so I'm thinking about, I'm listening to some of what you just talked about, uh, Venus, and, and I'm hearing that. And so, so I, I guess this kind of leads me to my next question. Many, many medical professionals are used to working anywhere from an eight to a 12 hour day. Um, you know, that's, that's expected. But with the, you know, forthcoming of this virus, you know, you're in a place where now you're being asked to show up a little earlier. Uh, you're being expected to stay a little bit later. Um, there are a number of different precautionary measures mm -hmm. that, that have to be put in place. So, so how have your work schedules um, increased to meet the growing demands of, of people seeking medical attention uh, related to COVID-19? And then what, what does a, a typical day you know, look like uh, for you as a medical professional? I know you all are doing different things in, in the arena, but what does a typical day look like and how have your work schedules had to change to meet these demands? So I'll jump in. Um, in terms of a typical day, well, the, the schedule, it's probably the same amount of hours. It's just the workflow and the day looks different now. So whereas instead of going to a lot of meetings and offices, a lot of Zoom meetings, we have that but a lot of time has been spent um, being creative. So in my field in particular, what are the things that we can do to support family members who can't be on site? What are the things that we can do to support staff members? You know, what is the scripting that we use? What are the compassionate techniques that we use? So a lot of that has gone into play. So the day is a lot of Zoom meetings, again, supporting staff, not spending as much time, say, on the units per se, but again, reaching the units in a different way with information, with best practices, helping to develop those resources and share those resources. So um, that's what it looks like. The hours are long, um, they've been long and they will still be long, <laughs> as I'm sure we can all relate to, but the day does look different in terms of what happens in the workflow. Yeah, I'd like to, I agree with you totally. I feel like the hours are definitely the same. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have longer days. It's mm -hmm. not always just a cut and dry 12 hour shift, mm -hmm. but just uh, like you said earlier, being adapt, the adapting part of our job is real. So um, we do do the same things, but you might be pulled somewhere else and it's just different needs that we have. And even meetings that we have on the floor are just different. Like you said, they try to really space us apart and um, do Zoom meetings as well so mm -hmm. I agree mm -hmm. yeah one of the challenges for us um, having had a similar experience where the hours are very similar and the schedule is very similar where I work um, but again part of the adaptability so for example I work in a, a pediatric primary care clinic is um, one of my jobs 
and we launched telemed we were planning to launch it but we launched it <laughs> <laughs> the launch of quarantine um and so families figuring it out providers figuring it out at the same time mm -hmm. it's interesting um so, and then, one second dr wilson tell us tell us and, and our audience what telemed is i see all the other parents are shaking their head i'm <laughs> like wait a minute mm -hmm. oh, that's something important what is that so telemed, and we actually in my practice use Zoom. So telemed is very similar to what we're doing. So it's a, a Zoom meeting between your clinician and um, the patient and parent. Well, right. because I work with pediatrics, mm -hmm. but um, again, so launching that. So then you have technical issues, you have consent issues, you have issues of some people still need to be brought into the office. Um, a lot of education, because as you can imagine. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. So managing that, um, making sure that we are addressing, I think the social emotional health in particular for the pediatric patients and families, uh, just because medically they haven't been the population that's been hit largest in terms of disease burden, but certainly the angst, um, the disruption in school, like <laughs> your, your conversation last week being very timely, um, because school is just a huge part of their mm -hmm. lives. And just understanding the concept of quarantine is very abstract for even a lot of the adults. So you can imagine your children who are concrete, um, mm -hmm. more concrete thinkers. Um, I also work in a well baby nursery. I don't know, we don't have much numbers on these, th uh, these things, but I have noticed um, kind of anecdotally that a lot of families seem to be coming to the hospital a little bit later than they normally would mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. they're kind of nervous to be there. A lot of them mm -hmm. want to go home sooner um, just so they're not in the hospital for as long. Um, so those kind of adjustments, and then also recognizing uh, the experiences of some of our colleagues, right? So for example, our respiratory therapy colleagues who may be still working a 12 hour shift, but their workflow is in some cases mm -hmm. doubled, if not higher in terms of managing a respiratory disease, as you can imagine, or our emergency room colleagues. Um, even environmental services who are in these rooms cleaning from top to bottom, you know, um, to make sure that patients and staff are safe. So, again, because we are, you know, often very multidisciplinary in, in healthcare, um, our own experiences, but those of our colleagues as well, taking all of that into account. And, I, and it's so important. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to let, let Venus get in a second, but I, I just want to say this, that um, really... There are so many things that have to be considered in this. I heard you talking about privacy concerns. I heard you talking about legal um, issues. Um, and then, of course, there are other people who are a part of the healthcare industry that we don't always think about mm -hmm. when we start talking about uh, healthcare workers. We think about the doctors, we think about the nurses, we think about uh, those in, in patient intake, but we're not thinking about those folks that are coming in uh, and, and having to clean up and sanitize. We're not thinking about those folks that are in, um, you know, in, in the areas that are, that are cooking and, and ensuring the dietary nutritional needs. Um, not only for the patients, but trying to keep that going for staff who are, who are there for these 8, 12 or more hours during the course of the day are met. So there's so much that goes into this. And that's why we really have to be considerate of our healthcare workers. And we can't stress anything else on tonight. That's one of the things I wanted to really get across by letting you all share, share your stories. Um, uh, Venus, come on, share, share with us what that typical day might look like on your end. Well, I'm glad you mentioned environmental services people because they are integral. We couldn't do what we do if it wasn't for them because every time you do you go into a COVID patient's room, well, now we've kind of, things are changing. Think healthcare will never be the same as it was before COVID, you know, because COVID's not going away. Um, you know, it's going to be here. And then once a virus is here, it's, it's here. We learn how to, to, to deal with it and how to, you know, come back on transmission and how to, you know, immunize against it. But we have to learn how to deal with things. And if something can happen one time, it can happen again. I mean, that's just common knowledge. So um, we've learned a lot of things along the way. And those environmental protection um, services people have learned, adapted, and keep us going. Because they have to, as you said, they have to strip those rooms down. And they even use things like UV light to help kill those viruses and things. And then there's time constraints before you can use certain rooms again. And, you know, if that patient has to. 
you somehow got muted. Oh, one second. So, you know, um, the days are about the same at number of hours for me, but like everybody, all our panelists are saying it's different and it changes from day to day, just like your patient flow changes from day to day. And, mm -hmm. and I feel for those patients that come in and um, they can't have a family member with them. They're just starting to let people come in to the hospital settings now through the emergency room a little bit, um, just in certain parts of the hospital. But people would come in and their family members would have to wait in a car outside. That's right. yeah. And that's unnerving, yeah. you know? Yeah, they couldn't come. They couldn't come because we had to protect them, the patient, and ourselves. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great segue um, you know, to the next question. And, and I'm, we're going to dig into that just a little bit more. Um, as part of the medical facilities, you were alluding to it, um, policies during this global pandemic, visitation, or even the accompanying of individuals who are not being treated to facilities has pretty much been non-existent. And I hear you saying that that's starting to change a little bit now. Um, this has left many family members without knowing firsthand how loved ones are doing uh, in, in, in that real time um, sense that we all like to have when a loved one is, is sick or gravely ill. Uh, and so oftentimes they've had to rely on information over the telephone, um, scheduled calls, um, permitting certain time blocks when that information could be disseminated um, to give updates on how patients are doing. Uh, in addition, one of the most heartbreaking things um, in scenarios of all of this has been the loss of life and the inability of families to be able to say proper goodbyes. I know uh, myself and my family has experienced that uh, on a couple of different occasions um, with the loss of life um, of, of loved ones, uh, two cousins and, and an aunt, um, and then have even had other cousins that have been in. Thanks be to God, they've recovered from this disease, but it has been nerve wracking, you know, trying to make decisions over the phone, trying to decide whether or not, you know, we're going to turn off a ventilator and, and, and allow, you know, a loved one to try to begin to breathe on their own, not knowing whether or not that could be their last breath. So it's been a lot. Um, and, and I know you all have been watching much of it firsthand. What are some things that you and your colleagues um, have done to make this a little bit easier on families? Well, I'll say um, where I work, we have, we've connected folks virtually. So we're using apps, you know, folks have smartphones, iPads, tablets, so we're doing that. Um, it's just that more so it's staff members taking the time to realize that there is a loved one, a family member, a friend who wants to see the face of their family member. I heard one story about a, a nurse who literally held up a cell phone until her arm got tired so that the different family members could each have a chance to see their loved one. And then she would switch and put the phone in the other hand and hold her other arm up literally standing by that patient's side. Um, the patient passed away, but giving families an opportunity to connect virtually. So it's really just, you know, the medium of telephones, virtual um, iPads, tablets, but really the, the, the human connection piece that comes through that is what makes the difference. A new meaning to bedside manner. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I've, um, personally, um, we are um, still strict with our um, visitation rules, so no one's able to visit. And some of the surgeries are major, and the, the, the patients are really sick, and the families do want to know how they're doing. And it can get tricky with HIPAA, so sometimes it's like we have to really find out who is able to get information over the phone, or we have to divert the conversation to the patient, like, we'll call the patient. Or I personally, so I had a, uh, well, I don't know if I can say too much, but I try to make sure that I give my patients a lot more of my time, speak with them, because it can be very isolating. Um, some people, this is their first time ever having surgery, and they have no one there. So I try to really get to know them as a person and mm -hmm. kind of spend some time, say, let me know, you know, if you want to talk, anything, because it's, it's isolating. It's, it really is. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So thank, again, um, and I, I, I probably will say it a dozen times. Thank you for what you do. You, you definitely have to have um, a heart, not only for what you do, but for people um, and the sacredness of, of human life. Um, and in and a, and a, and a day and time where that often is not really expressed across the board, for those people 
who are in the healthcare industry like yourselves and are taking the time to build those relationships even in this fast paced day. Thank you for what you do. Um, mm -hmm. Still in that vein, uh, healthcare workers, you're clearly no strangers uh, to people getting sick um, or even succumbing um, to, to their illnesses. However, COVID-19 has seen many individuals being infected and dying at alarming rates. What impact um, has this virus had on your emotional mental health? And, and a lot of times people don't think about it. Um, I know pastorally, um, you know, and, and seeing people, um, you know, dying. I know we went through a season um, in, in the faith community that I serve um, where we had pretty much experienced 13 deaths in the course of the year. And, and then in a period of about a month or two, uh, we, we experienced uh, five, I think, back to back. And I think every time I lifted up, you know, the phone, I'm like, please, not another, you know, talking to leadership. And, you know, a minute, I just had to go and just sit uh, for a minute on the side of the bed. My wife said, babe, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, it, I don't know, trying to be there for others, but the reality is you begin to build a rapport. You begin to develop relationships. Even if it's only over the course for a week, you're with someone during the most vulnerable and critical time of their life. And so you have to open yourself up as they're opening themselves up to be comfortable. So it does take a toll. So what impact does this have on your emotional mental health? Well, um, it can get stressful, honestly. You know, it's we're never happy as humans, completely happy. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are unhappy because they're at home, and we can't wait until we get home. We want to be at home. Um, it's different. So home for us is an outlet um, for me. Um, I have to get some physical activity in there. There are days, you know, there's, there was one day where I, I vented to my coworkers, you know, um, and then after I did it, I said, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't nasty about it. I just said some things that I needed to say. I just needed to get them off my chest. And when I did that, they said, you didn't say anything that we weren't thinking of ourselves. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> in the trenches. And so we, we deal with it, you know. We have to do things that are inconvenient for our families, too. People don't think about that. You know, um, since all of us have been working outside of the home, my entire household, and two of us work in healthcare, you know, we have plastic boxes by the kitchen door where we strip and our clothes go in there and Lysol's and everything is sitting right by the door, mm -hmm. you know, and everything goes right in the laundry. You know, we have to do that on a regular um, we have to, I pray, you know, uh, you know, that's just what I do. I pray a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I read Psalm 121 every day and anoint myself with oil and pray on, on my way into work that I'm covered because I have concerns too. You know, I, when I go into a COVID patient's room, you know, I keep thinking, you know, it could be me too, but I can't walk in fear. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it does play on your, your psyche, but we're stronger than that. And we've proven that we're stronger than that because we're going to be overcomers. We're going to overcome this. There are going to be casualties along the way. And we know that. But one thing I thought about yesterday when I was at work is every time a baby is born, they play a certain music. And every time somebody gets off a ventilator, they play a certain music. Right. And there was lots of music the last couple of days. And that made me feel so much better knowing that we are mm -hmm. going to make it through all of this. Wow. that That is definitely inspirational and I think you know that that's powerful um, that, that that's going on uh, where you are serving on, on the front lines because you know we talk about music being the universal language but I mm -hmm. think right now not only is it the universal language but it becomes the the language of hope uh, to inspire us when we're a little bit weary in the trenches, when we're like, oh gosh, I can't take any more of this today. To hear that song, with, no matter what song it is, just to hear the music, that's letting us know there's a bright spot um, and something for us to continue to keep pushing for. Okay, okay. Others that, that wanted to chime in on that one. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I agree that the, the focus on the hope and the positivity has been really important. Um, and again, the, the, for me, this, this 
self-awareness, right? So temperature checks with myself. Um, for example, very early on, I recognized that watching the news and the daily death counts was very triggering for me. Lord, so yes. I don't, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Also, giving myself more context and perspective. So for example, you know, the global burden of the disease or national burden of the disease, we see cases, um, but looking at the mortality rates, knowing that most cases are mild and most people do get over it and trying to focus on that, right? Um, also similar to what Venus said, like our hospital has implemented a code happy, like people making more attempts again, focus on the positive. And so when someone is discharged from the hospital, um, they have staff kind of line the hallway, socially distanced, mm -hmm. of course, with appropriate PPE, but really celebrate people being able mm -hmm. to go. And so again, focusing on the positive, um, as a pediatric clinician, it's not common, you know, we're used to dealing with viruses. It's very um, uncommon that children are not <laughs> greatly impacted. So that's been uh, another thing that I'm at least, you know, happy about. Um, again, just trying to find a silver lining, but uh, exercising and eating well and making sure I'm getting enough sleep um, and those kind of self-care things. Um, and, you know, really trying to, again, focus on the positivity and the hope. When I don my PPE to go into a room for a COVID positive patient, focusing on the fact that I have the appropriate PPE, I do know how to do this job, not forgetting the protocols, you know, because the angst, will, and fear for me, um, I think will compromise sometimes the, the logic and what you know how to do. So just relying on the I'm trained for this, I do know what to do, mm -hmm. we'll follow this and it will be fine. So. I think for me, um, there is certainly an impact. So I feel safe at work, but I think one of the things that gives me, I don't want to use the word worry, but where I find myself being concerned is with family members and ensuring that they're following protocol. So I know what I'm doing at the hospital, you know, where I work, I feel very safe, but wondering how the family members are, wondering if they are going to Costco just one too many times. <laughs> and so always reaching out to them saying, please don't do this, please shelter in place, please practice social distancing. So I think that's where I find myself thinking night and day about those, you know, wondering if they are following those precautions. But to Venus's point, we'll get through this. And it's really, for me personally, the faith, the meditation, those things, being connected, um, as Dr. Wilson said, minimizing the intake of news, all those things will help collectively to, to, to bring some stability and some peace and some hope. And just a time of rest as well, because we do have to rest in the midst of all this. Mm. Mm. Definitely important. Let's say, did you want to weigh in on that one? So I guess for me, it's a little different. I kind of can see other people's um, point of view. So for me, I was furloughed. So I kind of got to kind of be in the house and just kind of have that relief for me. Like I'm not like in the field. I'm now I'm back, you know, you can't, it doesn't last forever. So I'm back <laughs> now. So now I'm like a little concerned, like, uh. but I think for other people and I'm still under, like I'm still with my mom and everything. So, you know, for other people on my floor who were in my situation, they were like, where's the money coming from? So they had like other type of stressors, um, for not having the work. And like I said, I'm still, I'm very, I'm blessed to be in a situation I'm in. So I have no worries, had no worries. Now I'm coming into it, but I do feel protected. So I'm not as nervous. And I just have to, like you said, remember, like I'm trained to do this. I can do this. I will get through this. And that's kind of where I've been right now. So I'm in a, I'm in a good headspace right now. So. Definitely important. And, and I'm glad it seems that you all have found your rhythm it's so important in all of this because you're constantly on the go to be able to find your rhythm to ensure that you're keeping yourself um, a little bit of my old, old uh, coming from being a Boy Scout of mentally strong, uh, morally straight, all of the above <laughs> have to move through and navigate this. Uh, I want to say this with the halfway part to, to, our, to our folks that are joining us via Facebook Live and either those that are joining us here on Zoom platform. If you have questions, if you have questions for our panelists, go ahead. Now's a good time for you to go ahead, drop them in the chat, drop them in the uh, in the uh, the uh, the feed on Facebook Live, and we're going to field some of those um, during um, the the latter part of our time together um, today. So go ahead and drop them in, and I'll be checking in on those.
periodically. Want to make sure that you have questions out there in the audience that you're able to get those in. Want to shift gears just a little bit. Early on, there were a number of erroneous reports um, out regarding who could and who couldn't get COVID-19. Uh, one group in particular wrongfully cited by false reports as not being susceptible to the virus were African Americans. <laughs> the data has shown that African Americans have become infected and are dying at an alarming rate. So I want to talk about this for just a little bit, um, and you all can share from either what you've seen, mm -hmm. what you've heard from other colleagues or experiences you've had. What disparities uh, has this virus highlighted about the health care uh, with people of color in the United States. So what 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 are some of the disparities have been highlighted um, about healthcare with respect to people of color uh, in the United States? So um, social determinants of health <laughs> is something that we have talked about in healthcare for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And for people who might not understand that um, word in academia, but social determinants of health is an evolving science um, in healthcare, looking at not just disease, but that there are social and social economic factors mm -hmm. that contribute to people's health. And it's well studied, it's well documented, there are models. We knew beforehand that a lot of health disparities existed related to chronic disease. We know that there are things such as poverty and um, housing and access mm -hmm. to certain resources that make a difference and contribute to these things. So for example, Dr. Fauci was one of the people that commented on this and I was so happy to hear him talk about this mm -hmm. and say, we're, of course we're seeing these disparities in COVID because we saw these disparities before. We right. knew these things existed before. We knew these um, health inequities existed before, but we also knew these social determinants of health existed before. Um, and so I think moving forward, continuing to address this and mm -hmm. Hopefully, one of the things I can say is maybe in the midst of this pandemic, mm -hmm. we again will continue to dedicate resources um, to what that looks like and also um, implicit bias, mm -hmm. which I think people have been talking a lot. For example, you hear a lot with the maternal mortality discussions mm -hmm. that have been arising um, and gaining traction, thankfully, over the last couple of years. But um, clinicians and healthcare providers' views of some of their patients when they come in and how they address those concerns. And so I think all of these things are part of the disparities that we see um, currently with the pandemic. We also think about like sometimes a lack of private insurance. Um, sometimes some patients just are, they don't trust the health system and so they don't seek care early enough. Mm -hmm. uh, we also think about the lack of fresh food sometimes and the quality of foods in the community and the environments. And so all those things along with what Dr. Wilson shared it just ties into it. Wow. And then, and then also, I think a lot of times in our community, we don't practice preventive health. We wait until we have an issue, and then we take care of the, We try to take care of the, the issue, where it's always better to prevent a disease than it is to treat a disease. Correct. Yeah. That's so so, so that, that's a good place to lean into a little bit. Uh, a lot of times we don't like to talk about health. We don't, number one, we don't like to go to the doctor, uh, you know, as, as people of color, specifically men of color don't like to go to the doctors. You know, you got to drag them, you know, you know, you got to twist their arm, knock them over the head, you know, with some smelling salt underneath them. <laughs> into the hospital just to say, hey, bro, something ain't right here. You, <laughs> look into it. you know, you, you, your eyes are glossing over your cup. And so <laughs> preventative health, what are some underlying conditions that folks are not even realizing that make them prone to catch a virus like COVID-19? What are some of those underlying conditions that, that mm -hmm. people are not even realizing that, hey, this has me at risk. And I, and I need to do some things to help deal with those things. Mitigate. I'm not further putting myself uh, in the position where I can contract something like COVID-19. What, what are some of those? Um, I think high blood, pre high blood yeah. pressure is one of the biggest culprits in our, in our, our culture that's yeah. silent. And we don't, we don't address that. Um, and a lot of it's diet-based, okay? Um, lack of exercise, diabetes. All of those things, mm -hmm. you know, yep. we talk about high blood pressure and people having sugar and 
all of those things, um, all inflammation, you know, people are inflamed. Inflammation is really causing a lot of problems. People don't realize that we can work on it. We can do things. It's uncomfortable. And for our culture, it seems unnatural, but there are certain things that we're going to have to change. Otherwise, you know, along with the socioeconomic aspect of it, you know, we have to, we have to be mindful that we have to be active, proactive mm -hmm. rather than reactive. Mm -hmm. That's it. I think a lot of times we have, we know that we have conditions, but it's just easier to not address them or to just, you know, go on kind of business as usual until a person crashes or hits that brick wall. And then I have high blood pressure, I've had cancer, I have diabetes. So I think it's kind of a combination, but I think many times we know, but again, more education, as you said, just awareness and really having to push some people, but um, it's there. And I think to Venus's point, being proactive instead of reactive. Yeah. Absolutely. And to be, uh, you mentioned underlying conditions, but it's specifically the underlying conditions that are uncontrolled, right? So for example, mm -hmm. diabetes is a chronic health condition that can be controlled though. So mm -hmm. uncontrolled yes. though is your higher susceptibility. So it's not even just the chronic diseases, but to the point that Chastity and Venus have made, mm -hmm. taking steps would, would, would excuse me, things that are in your control to do to control these diseases, decrease your risk of susceptibility to COVID-19 and other um, viruses and ailments. So, so what are some of those things? And, and I heard you alluded to some of them, even, even talking about, you know, diet and things like that. What can African-Americans do to mitigate not only the risk of this virus, but bring down uh, the mortality rate that exists in our community? What are some things? Mm -hmm. I think that I was just going to say that's like a, a deeper question because it's like we've had these comorbidities for a long time already. So I feel like education is a lot. I'll let you dig into it because you, you seem like you were getting ready to. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and I agree with you, Lachey. It, it's breaking it down, right? So for example, the why is very important. And I say this to patients all the time, like the response gives us some information, but the why context gives us a lot more. So for example, why do we have higher rates? Some of it is preventive. Some of them are things that we can't hand, we don't necessarily have control over. For example, disproportionately, we are in uh, careers where we're essential workers. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the luxury statistically to stay home. Work from home, right, right. right. <laughs> Statistically, Black families and Latino families, yeah. um, about 25%, I think, in the United States are multi-generational, right? And so your household may not be of two or three people. You might even have a larger household. Mm -hmm. um, and so those things, again, are those parts that those nuance, we don't control as much. But again, like Venus and Chastity said, and I think patients are a lot of times underestimate how important these things are, but literally things like regular sleep, exercise, water, <laughs> fruits and vegetables, um, cutting sugar, hand washing, <laughs> hand washing, like yeah. that was a big thing for me. Um, <laughs> a global pandemic, yeah. su sufficient hand washing would go so far, even in the midst of a global pandemic. So to think of something like that, that's something all of us can really do. And stress as well. Stress plays a big part in this. And so there are some stressors that just seem to be, to be put on us, but there are also some things that perhaps we can control mm -hmm. and some stressors that we don't need. And once we've identified those things, again, being willing to make the changes because stress can really impact the health in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, de de this is definitely a time for, for you to let some stuff go. Uh, I understand, you know, if you are, are blessed uh, in whatever way, shape, or form to have a little bit of time at home breaking your regular routine, now is a good time to make that list of the things that are, are not adding to you and that are detracting from you. Now is the time to make that list of all the things that are causing you to be up at night and, and you're not getting adequate amounts of sleep. Now is the time to think about those things that are causing you to keep going to the refrigerator over and over and over again. And it ain't just because you're bored. Sometimes you're trying to keep your mind off of 
this, that, him, her, them, all of that stuff. Now's the time to make that list and and uh as as young folks would say, to cut it. To cut, cut it. it. Cut it. Gotta cut it. Cut it. Gotta cut it. All cut right. It. <laughs> say it again for him. <laughs> cut it. <laughs> Uh, another group that reports are on the rise about seeing spikes in uh, cases of infections are our children. Um, in fact, and it was so mind blowing. Um, I was talking to uh, to one of my big sisters earlier um, today, and, and I was just telling her I was getting ready for for tonight's episode, and she was sharing with me. It just goes to show how small a world we were living in. She shared with me um, that. Uh, that she's connected um, from family uh, through, through one of the young ladies that recently lost her life to COVID-19. It was in the news. Um, a 15-year-old girl in Baltimore, you all remember, may remember having heard um, the news report, died from COVID-19. And it, it was once a point when this all started out that uh, the thought was that it was uh, people that were in the at-risk populations were folks that were over 65, over 60, over 70, and, and those that had these long-standing conditions. And that for the most part, you weren't hearing a lot about children contracting um, the disease. Uh, so schools have been doing um, distance learning since mid-March. Um, we'll soon be on summer break, and in a matter of months, we'll be at the start of a new school year. Considering, considering what we are now hearing with the growing number of children's coronavirus cases, do you think we are at the point with this virus where it will be safe to resume in-person learning in the fall in light of the fact that back to school time, many of you know this, and, and Dr. Wilson, I know uh, in pediatrics, you definitely experienced this, uh, back to school time is widely known as the time for, for things like the common cold to spread, and right after that, you're into flu season. We have not yet gotten a handle on this, and now children are being impacted. So, so do you think it's wise, and I, and I know this is your opinion, but do you think it's wise for us to begin in-person learning? And I'm open for all to weigh in on this one, um, but Dr. Wilson, if you'd like to take the lead, that'd be great. Um, I pause because I think that's a very difficult question. So, and here's why. One, from the beginning, and even now, um, you know, it's very hard for us to hear about people passing, but let alone children. It's always a very difficult topic. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been some children that have um, died, but what the numbers are showing us is that children, um, some of them will get sick, but they are not the greatest number of cases. Mm -hmm. um, and those that do become sick, most of them will do well um, and recover. And so that's a good thing. For example, like in the district, I believe, you know, the cases among, you know, the age group zero to 18 is less than 5%. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's DC. So I say that's also part of why it's complicated. It depends on, so the CDC's, um, thought so far is that it depends on the community burden of disease, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, your areas that have higher community um, disease burdens and like, for example, Maryland, the state of Maryland is top 10. Um, what school uh, plans look like for those areas might be very different than areas that have low community burden. Mm -hmm. um, so again, to everyone's point that COVID is not going anywhere. And honestly, you know, we have known that there are viruses. We just live in a very germy world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many of us in healthcare, a lot of these practices that now we've been talking to the public, a lot of us have been doing them from beginning, you know? <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. what might be considered compulsive hand washing, <laughs> not wearing shoes in your home, um, being germaphobes, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, making sure that schools are thinking about those things, right, mm -hmm. um, will be important. So distancing where possible in the classroom, what are gonna be their sanitation protocols, 
Also, maybe perhaps screening because children belong to adults. So what adults are coming into the school building, what adults are dropping off their children. And so, again, um, making sure that staff are appropriately screened before they're coming into work, um, mm -hmm. that there is a culture of um, acceptance with people calling out. I, I think mm -hmm. it's easy to say, you know, if you're sick, stay home. Um, but if your supervisor is going to give you a hard time, if you know you won't get paid, these kinds of uh, systemic issues are deterrents for people not always reporting and fully disclosing. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, I think these are all important considerations. I still really don't have an answer <laughs> to, to, to give you a direct response to your question about whether we're ready in the fall. I think um, we'll have to see. Yeah, I, I know as a parent, I mean, we are, I mean, at home, it, we, we, we know when the news broke here, um, you know, in the state of Maryland, I think it was on a Thursday. Um, and my wife and I had a conversation, and, and then, you know, by the time the word broke uh, from the governor on down to the superintendent of schools, that schools would be closed on Monday. And, and my wife immediately, you know, uh, you know, her her radar and antenna went off, and she's just like, on Monday, but tomorrow's Friday. She's right. like, oh, no, 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 you know, wait a minute, you know, it, this, this gonna have to be a day that we gonna have to take a hit on attendance, if it is important enough for us to close schools on Monday, that means it's still important enough for us to do something about it today. So y'all want to stay home. And, and so the kids began, it took them a little while for them to understand why we in here, why we on lockdown, why we can't go out and play with our friends. And so, you know, the more they began to hear about it, you know, uh, we talk about it all the time. Now we offer them opportunities to go outside. And it's like, eh, you know, we went outside yesterday. We got some fresh air yesterday because there's this whole thought process that, wait a minute, maybe it's not <laughs> safe. You know, we made them paranoid, but they're now considering the risk factors a, a little bit more. Um, so uh, I'm going to throw another one out there. Um and, 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 I, and I, I, I kind of told Dr. Wilson earlier uh, that I was going to lean into her a little bit on it. We had this talk this morning. I woke up, and I keep my phone probably like everybody does by the bed, and, and I woke up and saw um, a push feed across talking about uh, 23 new cases um, at, at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C., uh, of something uh, known as, um, I, I would say, MISC, M-I-S-C, Multi-System Inflammatory Syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Dr. Wilson, if you can, I, I know you said you don't have a, a wealth of information on it, but could you just share with us a little bit uh, for us lay folks what that might mean, and is that something for us to be concerned about? Yeah, so um, it's, uh, as you mentioned, um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, and I don't know much about it, but um, neither do the infectious disease specialists right now, <laughs> unfortunately, which is quite unnerving for a lot of them. And they have seen, you know, case reports globally. They've seen some in Europe, as you mentioned, the 23 cases here in other parts of the country, people have been reporting it. Um, and vaguely, broadly, it's um, inflammation or swelling um, across multiple bo body systems, right? So that could be your heart, that could be your lungs, that could be your kidneys, it could be your brain, it could be your skin, um, et cetera. Um, but what we do know is that it's a rare complication. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, as I mentioned to you earlier, I tell my families, you know, to focus on the outliers. Um, awareness is important, but to, to not make ourselves anxious, more anxious mm -hmm. than we need to be. Um, okay. so I say be cautious, but not overly anxious. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, let, let's shift a little bit, um, mm -hmm. and, with, and I'll get everybody to work in on this particular question, um, you know, so much right now because we've been home since mid-March. Um, 
And I think for a lot of us, I, I talk to different colleagues across different um, you know, spectrums of folks that this is the longest I've been home. I'm used to being running and on the go. And granted, you know, frontline workers is a little bit different, but even with your ability to go beyond your work day has been, it been limited. And so there's this whole conversation now um, across the um, uh, municipalities, government areas, we're talking about, um, and I'll use the phrase the way it's being quoted, opening outside back up. Um, or when outside yeah. opens up, such as I'm going, I'm raring to go, people are making all these plans. Yeah. Um, even with the numbers of infections and, and death tolls, um, you know, trying, I'll say trying to come down, trying to come down. You hear about places like China that, that originally uh, where things kind of sort of blew up and then you kind of sort of heard the things have calmed down a little bit there and we are kind of sort of on the back end uh, of that but there's still a great number of people and I think someone alluded to it earlier who are not taking coronavirus seriously right. at all. Some even believe that it is even a hoax mm -hmm. or a conspiracy theory with the government you know all of this type of stuff with their lack of willingness um, to weigh the severity of the virus, um, you know, people just, you know, not taking the necessary precautions. I guess I have two questions, and I'll invite each of you to weigh in on it. Number one, what impact does that have on your workload when things like um, the beach opens up and everybody decides we need to show up at the beach or, or things like, you know, I, I'm a D.C. native. You know, I remember a couple of uh, maybe about a week or two back, um, there was all these folks that decided they wanted to show up at the D.C. wall. No social distancing, nobody, hardly anybody in <laughs> all this type of stuff going on. Um, you know, what impact does folks just figuring, okay, it ain't, it ain't affecting me, it's not hitting me, I can go back to business as usual now that my restrictions have been lifted. What impact does that ultimately have on your workload? And then I guess the second question I would ask is what message uh, do you have for people who think it's time to resume business as usual um, as, 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 as people are trying to say, we're ready to get back, we've been inside long enough. What message do you have to them as a healthcare worker about the seriousness of it and the consequences that could unfold if everybody just runs back outside because it's now open? Well, I guess I'll go first. I'm, I'm not, I'm just not, I, I'm not, I, I don't think, I don't, okay, I'm going to try and be politically correct about it. No, this straight talk, just say it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't trust everyone else enough yet to take the proper precautions. Mm. Um, I look at the way that we're even handling food services in a hospital situation. There's no, um, there's no bars out there. Everything is packaged or it has to be served to you a certain way. Okay. Um, because we don't want cross contamination and right. people are going to be touching things and not everyone washes their hands properly as Dr. Wilson said. Mm -hmm. um, people aren't always polite and cough in their sleeve and then go wash their hands or, mm -hmm. you know, people just aren't ready. I don't think they're ready. And to protect myself, I, and, I, and I also as an offset, I found that I'm, I'm spending less money yes. because I'm doing things at home and I found how to be self-sufficient, okay? mm -hmm. <laughs> more self-sufficient and making myself happy. Those lists that you mentioned before, I'm starting to work on some of my to-do lists, mm -hmm. you know, and those are bringing me satisfaction. Um, I'm not saying that I'm completely closing myself off. I'm going so I'm gonna go out and be able to do certain things, but I'm just at the point now where I can, my mother's in her 70s. I just finally, in this weekend, was able to sit outside with my mom, within you know, six feet apart. We had masks on. Because what I would do to protect her is I would drop things at the door and I wouldn't pass through the threshold because right. I wanted to make sure she was safe. 
So, you know, I look at that way. I, I, you know, I try to handle my car as a clean zone. So when I bring things in my car, I wipe, you know, wipe the wheel down. I wash my hands, you know, clean my hands with sanitizer before I come in the house. I make sure my, my threshold tries to be a safe zone. So I don't think everybody's learned how to keep those safe zones yet. Mm -hmm. You know, until I feel as I do and, then, and you look at the numbers and see things are okay or I don't see a rush of patients starting to come towards me, you mm -hmm. know, that's when I'll start to venture out a little bit more. That's good. That's good. I like that. Keep in safe zones. Y'all write that down. Figure out what some safe zones and, and, and not just in the midst of the pandemic, but that's a good life practice. Keep in safe zones to protect yourself from, from as the word would say, from danger seen and unseen. unseen. That's it. That's it. That's it. Uh, ladies, uh, go ahead and weigh in. Forgive me. Oh, I, I want to go outside just like the next person. I want to, you know, you know, run around. But I agree with you. Um, you can't trust the left person to the left or the person to the right. So I just, I'll just wait too. I mean, it's just not to me. It's not worth it. And I feel like the impact it'll have on us is just the influx, and mm -hmm. it'll just be an influx for us if the people go out there and are doing different, you know, just doing things to keep safe. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100%. I'm just going to wait on it. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I think about it, people begin to get out too soon and they're moving about and not practicing the social distancing and they become ill, then they, are, they find themselves coming to the hospitals mm -hmm. where you already have a flood of patients and you never turn anyone away. But again, hospitals are severely impacted. Staff members are stretched. And so mm -hmm. are we being selfish by not saying, you know what, let me do all that I can so that I do not have to go and seek care. So my message to anyone would be to just take it slow, think through it. We don't want to lose the gains that we've made. And of course, we all want to get back to, I don't think it will ever be as it was. We want to get back to some of those liberties and freedoms that we enjoyed in the socialization and activities. But again, what is the impact on people who are ill, the system? Are we looking at the data? We don't want to lose the gains that we've made. So I would say take it slow and let's just not rush it. It is uncomfortable. It is new. But sometimes, as, we, as we've heard, we have to learn to be comfortable with the things that are somewhat uncomfortable. Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> I will be at home as well. <laughs> say, say boom, boom. <laughs> right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we're, we're just about at, at our time uh, for this evening. I, I do have one final question that, that I'd like you all um, to all the way in on. Um, and, and then after that, uh, we're, we're going to invite folks. Um, if you didn't get an opportunity to get your question in, um, the, uh, our panelists, they've had long days, um, and, but they, they graciously agreed uh, for a few minutes. And when I say a few minutes, I mean just a few minutes. Um, join uh, me over on Instagram Live. Um, you follow me at CoolWater714. You can join us over there. Um, I'll, I'll be talking to them uh, for just a few minutes over there um, with a couple of other questions. And then we're going to let these ladies get some much needed rest before they start it all over again tomorrow. But just to close our time out here tonight um, with our panel, uh, being a frontline worker surely cannot be easy. And, and just listening to so much of, of what you shared tonight, some things that I wasn't even thinking about that had to be considered. Um, I guess for me, you know, just thinking about what you do. Um, you know, you clearly have to have a heart uh, for this line of work. And people have been expressing uh, their appreciation for you um, and your colleagues in some amazing ways uh, with thank you parades and uh, uh, special shopping hours and, and paying it forward and things like that. Uh, where have you seen the most powerful sentiments of appreciation demonstrated? Um, and, and then it, 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 as you're sharing some of those, um, what gives you hope and strength to keep going in the midst of this global pandemic? So, so where have you seen some of the most powerful uh, sentiments of appreciation uh, demonstrated? And then I guess closing that out would be what gives you hope and strength in the midst of this pandemic? I appreciate the masks that a lot of people have, they, you know, someone, you know, I felt like a lot of people forgot about that, but they have been coming through lately. Like, I just really appreciate a lot of people like donating their services, making masks, or even 
we have like these bonnets we wear, buffets, scrub caps, uh, whatever you call them, make those and they'll donate them to us. And I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the special hours that they have for people. I don't really like that the elderly have to go out and for themselves. I wish their grandkids would do it. <laughs> but um, um, I appreciate that they have something like that in place for them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's nice when, you know, when you see a patient and they come out and they say, thank you for your service. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. um, just that makes a big difference. And, you know, when you go out and you go to different establishments, you know, different stores are giving some uh, little discount here or there. And the first thing they say is, oh, you know, thank you for your service. Um, that does make a difference. It gives you hope that what you're doing really is making a difference. And that's, it's an advocation. I don't, I, me personally, I, I'm, I'm sure all our panelists feel the same way. You know, we do this because we want to do it. You know, um, it takes a certain kind of person to work in healthcare and to stay the course, because a lot of people leave along the way that just can't handle it. There's a lot of other jobs that I wouldn't be able to handle either. So it's an advocation. So that's what we're supposed to do. Wow. I would say I've seen a lot of just um, tremendous acts of kindness, donations of food. I mean, you know, you look up and you see 500 meals coming um, for staff members, or you see um, donations given to the foundation for emergency funds. As Lachey was saying, sometimes staff members are furloughed, there are other needs, and just when monies are, you know, are given, it can help with supplies or just any number of things. And even the notes of gratitude, when you see children writing notes or preparing, making cards, um, mm -hmm. just the kindness is shown. And I think what gives me hope is, I think us, I think you know, I've seen so much love and kindness shown and just the cleanliness, um, the expressions of faith, praying when it's appropriate. So I think just the unity and the messages of unity that I've seen, not just in the community, but I mean across the board, probably across the globe, that has really given me so much hope. And in the clean environment as well, there was that image of the skyline or something and it was so green, you could see the beautiful colors. So I think all those things just collectively have given me so much hope. Wow. Absolutely, I would say the, the displays of compassion, you know, even um, in the settings amongst um, staff, you can tell that there is a, a, a different um, camaraderie and investment in, you know, we'll all be okay and that we're in this together. Definitely a spirit of that I felt. Um, and again, just seeing those stories of, you know, um, the donations, like Lachey said, the mask, um, the brother that um, set up hand washing stations for those experiencing homelessness and oh, wow. those kinds of, of, of acts of, of compassion and selflessness are just uh, really beautiful to see. And so those have definitely given me hope. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do day in and day out, putting your lives uh, on the line for us, uh, for our families. Uh, truly, I know that uh, millions of people all over the world join with me. I'm um, saying that it is a debt of love that we can never repay, but we are truly grateful uh, for you and all that you do. Um, sometimes thankless, but um, we're grateful for those mm -hmm. expressions. And I'm going to just say, keep them coming. Keep them coming. That is what lifts up the spirits of our frontline healthcare heroes. So whatever you can do, just thinking of them to help to make their job a little bit easier, keep do it. Uh, from the bottom of our hearts, we say thank you. Know that you are in our prayers in the days ahead. So to all my panelists, uh, uh, Ms. Chastity Johnson, Ms. Lachey Williams, Dr. Damali Wilson, and Mrs. Venus Eskimisi Walker, thank you ladies for your time on this evening. Uh, they'll be joining me uh, for just a few minutes over on IG Live. Follow me at Coolwater714 and you'll be able to hear just a few more minutes of our conversation. If you enjoy, if you enjoy tonight's episode of Straight Talk No Chaser, guess what? There is more. You can come back right here next week. Um, you, in the meantime, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Straight Talk No Chaser. Go ahead and subscribe. You can catch up on all the latest episodes of of our show. 
joining me back here next week. Uh, she is the love of my life, uh, my better half, my lovely wife, Lady Ron, is going to be back as my co-host next week. Uh, and we are going to be excited to have as our special guest, Miss Brittany Campbell, who is the owner, operator, and head chef of Siblings Catering right here in Baltimore, Maryland. And she will be cooking up some good stuff live and helping you to diversify your menu in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, she has assured me, I'll say this uh, while you all are on the line, she has assured me that she's going to have some healthy stuff in the midst of it. We're eating right uh, in the midst of all of this, but I know <laughs> I'm not the only one that wants to change up the menu just a little bit. Can't have chicken all the time, fish all the time. We got to figure out how to mix this thing up because we home and we got to eat. We don't uh, <laughs> we don't live to eat. We eat to live. So we want to make sure that we're doing that in the right way. And so we're excited about her joining with us on and so we'll be going with that. Uh, until next week, thank you, family, for joining us. We say to one and all, peace and blessings. We'll see you right back next week on Straight Talk No Chaser with Dr. JJG. You can go ahead now and join us over on IG Live. We'll be there for just a few minutes. Take care, family, and have a blessed rest of your evening. Good night.